which is you know try try to get used to use RX Swift, which is like something that was very close to my heart ever since I started <laughs> doing programming. So just a little bit of background. I uh, I did four years at accounting at SMU, and uh, you know after that just got bored of it. It was just getting so mundane. So I switched to I switched to programming. So I did Android first, and I've been a serious iOS dev uh, developer for like six months or so. So um, I think in terms of you know experience. I definitely lack in a, in a lot of areas, especially like iOS specific libraries and such. But I always try to be a tech generalist in in a sense that what I'm about to present to you will be applicable across like whatever platform you use. So, uh, so what I'm going to present to you today. Uh, so, has anyone ever used like Core Data in your app production app before? Yeah. Do you think it sucks? <laughs> yeah, it sucks, right? So. So I think the, the thing about core data is I, do, I cannot understand why Apple being s the stellar company it is produces such a sucky library. Because you know, core data has a lot of shared state. And you know, in, in an application, if, if, we if we want to avoid bugs, then we have to cut down the number of shared state that we uh, you know, have in our app. So with this library, we can have a totally stateless app. So all the state is centralized in one area. So um, and it's very, it's used uh, so you may think that it's just a you know new a new cool thing. I may not you know I may may not have time to pick it up, but we have ex uh, used this successfully in our production app at Hormuz because we have a product called Glycolite, which uh, helps you like lock glucose and lock food in order to help you control diabetes. So um, when when I joined, you know the, the the app was very buggy, a lot of crashes. And then I spent the next five to six months refactoring using the new framework, reactive functional programming with RX Swift. And then now nowadays, I think it's 99% crash-free. And unless you intentionally try to make it buggy, it's, there's not going to be bugs. So um, for that, let me just run a sample project which may interest you. And uh, yeah, I should have opened this beforehand. So here I have a very simple app that you know I have a user object that I just want to change some properties. So the thing about the Apple's classical MVC model is that you have a lot of cross view communications. So with this library, so let's say I want to change my name to this. Yeah, this is my actual name, and this will be reflected in elsewhere. And there's no direct communication between these two views because in a reactive functional uh, architecture you only have one source of truth, which is your database. So every all the views will listen to changes from the database. And then uh, if you want to make changes, then they will post, they will send an action that update the database. So, and uh, you know, I have a bunch of uh, goodies here. I mean, you can just change a bunch of, uh, a lot of these and just gonna update. So the principle behind this, so what, what I'm going to do right now is try to go through the, the building blocks and the patterns that I truly believe in. So uh, the first thing, I believe in immutability. So uh, to be immutable, you, you are not able to change properties after you create an object. And how I achieve that is with the buildable pattern, so which is built on the builder pattern. So how it works is like this. So uh, there's a clone builder method in order for you to clone an object and change the properties. So here I have a very handy playground like this. As you can see, let's say I have a class A. I mean, it can be anything. And then I have the builder, A builder. So I mean, e everyone should be familiar with the builder pattern, right? Yeah. So, so how this works is that every builder, uh, every buildable will have one builder. And then every builder will have one buildable. So in the sense that, so uh, I will just implement this method called with buildable, and then it uh, it will set the properties for the a property in this in this builder object. So in the sense that, so let's say I create a an, an a object a dot builder dot with, then I set these properties, and then I can expose a method called clone builder. So how clone builder is implemented is is this so in when the buildable dot builder equals to the builder dot buildable 
you can you can automatically implement it like self dot builder with builder self then essentially this all oh, fun facts um uh, yeah so essentially this will help you achieve immutability because like after after you have set uh, after you have do uh, you have done a cloning these two objects will be completely different so it doesn't matter whether it's a class or a struct you can use a class, but with this pattern, there, there will be no reference to, to an object at all. So uh, this is the, the pattern that I use the most across all my applications. And yeah, that is one useful thing. Another thing is the parallel object model. So if you use core data before, you, you would know that we, we are tied to the NS managed object. So uh, in, in my personal opinion, using uh, NS managed object creates a lot of problems in the sense that if the context you put that NS managed object in somehow is you know the the reference to that context is lost then all your NS managed object properties will be nil so what I'm trying so what I do with this is that I would have a parallel object model I would have a core data object which is like something that I communicate with the NS managed object context and then I will convert that into a pure object representation in, uh, so that pure object can be a struct, but it's just that it doesn't have anything to do with core data at all. So uh, I have a nice little chart here to show you the benefits of a pure object approach. And it's, you know, there's no inheritance required. It's immutable, it's stable in the sense that the properties once set, they're, not, they're never going to be nil. And then it's visible in, in the sense that, so let's say uh, you don't want to you don't want to use core data in the future. Let's say you want to use RAM. With a pure object approach, you can actually substitute core data because the upper layers of the uh, of the application, which is like your views and your view models, you know, models, only know these pure objects. So that, that's why it's very easy for you to change sub out core data. And uh, you know, it's immutable. So you 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 are not worried that the, the state may change at any uh, at a moment's notice. And uh, to be honest, I don't, I don't expect to, uh, I, I don't expect to go like, very technical into all this because this is very, very complicated. So let's say I have a user object here, which is, which is the thing that I was, I was showing you that that was changing in the app. So what I mean by the parallel object model is that I would have a CD object. This is a, uh, a NS managed object subclass, and I will have all these NS managed properties like ID, name, age, visible, updated. Uh, and then I would have the user object, which is like the pure object, with the exact same properties, but it's just that everything is a get and there's no set. And then for each user, would have a user builder, would have a user builder, and then uh, with all these uh, building methods, and then uh, with clone builder as well. Then after that, so the, the library will know, the, uh, the library request framework will know how to handle these and convert between a core, core data object and a pure object. So um, I have a lot, a bunch of protocols here for the managed object to, to implement, but the only thing that you have to implement at a minimum is, the, is this one, is the HMCD object master type and then uh, you would have to implement a few a few methods like this mutate with pure object. So this is the one where we actually mutate the core data object internally, because because you know that when uh, when we use core data, when you mutate the properties of the core data object, it will actually save to the to the main context. And so so that's why uh, I I would advise any everyone not to use the core data object directly because it's very misleading. It's not thread safe. So at all and yeah let's just skip this part so more importantly uh, yeah that's that's just like the basics so let's go to the to the main thing that I was talking about the railway architecture so this is the part where I have to use board so uh, in a railway architecture would have two parallel parallel uh, structure so let's say this is the railway right so this is one one part and this is the other part. So let's say this is the success case and this is the failure case. So in a railway architecture, it, it surmises that 
the result of the previous request must become the input for the next request. So in the sense that, so let's say I have one request here, and uh, this one can either be a success or a failure, right? So if this is a failure, and this will go to this stream, become here, but we must find a way to bridge the failure back to the success case. So, uh, so this is this part is called an, an, an adapter. So we adapt it back. So if we manage to do this, then we have like one whole long stream of requests that is always successful. But it's just that the the failure is captured internally. So the real the railway architecture is the 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 um, inspiration of this comes from F F sharp because you know I was I was reading an article. This they were talking about how how to do reactive programming. I mean functional programming, not not even reactive. So uh, yeah, and then this this architecture strikes me as particularly useful when we when when you want to have like a very clear and concise flow of logic, and then uh, you know just one stream. Whenever it errors out, it will go back to success stream, and then it will propagate the error downstream until it reaches the subscriber. So. With that in mind, let's go to. So, uh, as you can see here, I mean, if you have used Rx Swift before, you you would be familiar with things like observable, uh, you know, observer behavior subject, all that. So, in a in a railway architecture, this would be like let's say we have an API called called sync local data which is what we actually have in, in the Glycolic app. So we would have the fetch user from, from database. So this, is, this will be performed by the request framework. So the previous here is the result from any previous request. So if this is a failure, then the request will just fail. The, the failure will be propagated down all the way to the subscriber. So fetch user from DB, and then you flat map it into a patch user remotely, and then flat map into absurd user, flat map into fetch updated payment plans, flat map into absurd payment plan. So let's say here, the fetch user from DB returns you an error. Let's say there's no user in a database. So let's say the error is like, uh, how, do we, how do we say, um, no user in DB, the error message. So in this method, in this method, the generator is supposed to unwrap that error and then rethrow it in, into the result of this request. So if from this step to this step, the result of this step is also an, uh, the, the same error, which is like user does not exist. And it continues down, down all the way here. This one also rethrows the same error. This one rethrows the same error. This one rethrows the same error. So that's why you only have one stream. If the upper part fails, then that error would be propagated all the way downstairs. So that's why you know you don't need any if, if this, if that, any try, catch. Everything is one stream, very clear logic. You can put you can put like logging, you can put uh, analytics, you can put beacons, and it all is going to be in the same stream. So that's why it's very clear, very easy to understand, and uh, very straightforward. So. So let's go to the main meat of the presentation, uh, which is the core data wrapper. As in, I, as I have mentioned before, core data has many quirks, and uh, I don't like it. But it's undeni uh, un undeniably useful in the sense that uh, it has the fetch result controller, so that you can actually stream objects from a database to to your to your UI. So, but but the mechanism in which it does it is very is very coupled. So I am very I'm a big anti fan of coupling, and uh, core data. Once you once you use it in a classical way, there's no way you can escape because everything has to be done the same uh, uh, the way that it it is intended. Like you must always have a uh, singleton NS manage object context. You must use NS manage object. You know you must do this, you must do that. But if you use this uh, request framework, you will have to do none of that and everything will be abstracted into a common interface called observable, which is like Rx Swift. So uh, yeah, this is the, uh, the request framework. is something that, that uh, I spend a lot of time writing, testing, and is used in the production app very successfully. Um, and the main benefit is just immutable, stateless, 
and you know there's try the and and as well as the railway architecture model so uh like once and this is like use especially useful for uh, for mvvm architecture which is like model view model view uh i mean i i don't i, I don't understand why apple still pushes for mvc i mean Nowadays, apps are getting like very complicated, and th there's a lot of cross view communications. People are still using delegates. They're still using, uh, non, uh, you know, they're just having like several layers delegates communicating with each other. I mean, that's, I mean, uh, since it's 2018, what we what we use at Hormas is uh, we use a combination of Redux. So we also have a Redux implementation in Swift, and then we use the request framework in order to to perform. Uh, you know, so that the views will subscribe to the database stream, and then every time the user object changes or anything you want to stream, it will reflect on the view itself. So that's why there's no, there's absolutely no potential for bugs, unless I mean, unless I mean, Rx Swift is buggy itself, which I don't, I, I believe is not. So uh, the request uh, the request processor, this one, you know, this took me a lot of time to write. But I'm not going into the technical details here. So uh, it can help you do, you know, save, absurd, delete, reset, and stream. Uh, and then, yeah, so I also have a wrapper for the fetch result controller, and then it will stream pure objects instead of, uh, instead of uh, call data objects. So that's why. The, this way, this feature enables two-way communications between the UI and database, and then it also support pagination. So in a sense, that let's say, uh, because in a glycolit app, we have a lot of timelines. So each timeline will, will you know, correspond to, let's say, uh, a comment, a food log, um, a step log, or a glucose log. So we, I mean, in a, in a single client, you, you may have like thousands of timelines in the same database. So uh, what what this stream helps you do is that it will help you paginate based on your based on based on your page count. Let's say you want like five items per page, and then uh, you just need to supply a trigger. So let's say when when you scroll up, and then uh, they, you want to see the next page, something like that. So uh, I think that's that's enough technical for uh, for today's presentation. I mean, if you have questions, you can just approach me. Uh, and I will explain in more details because it's not it's not possible to cover everything uh, technical about this library like within 30 minutes. I would say even even when I was working with my team, it took us a few months to get comfortable. But I mean, after you go that way, you're never gonna go back because you're so you're so used to dealing with no state at all that you don't want to go back because you don't you don't just don't want to handle state anymore. And then uh, you know. I think it's a good it's a good thing to pick up like functional programming. I mean, reactive functional programming two parts reactive and functional. And if we combine both of those, we can have a very um, stable app. And you know, no cross view communication, immutable, all that. So, I think this is the point where I should show more of a of the sample app because you know, seeing seeing is believing, right? And Although although the sample app may look like very simple to you, but uh, it actually encompasses a lot of techniques. So let's say here we have a user profile VC, which is this one. Uh, let's say I want to insert a new user, and then I use. Uh, so uh, the other day I went for a for an interview, and then they were asking me. Um, so can you tell me the names of the of the life cycle of a view controller, I said, "Come on, what year is it? You only need you only need one, which is view load. There's nothing else you need. Okay, you don't need view will appear. You don't need view will disappear. None of that. So in in the view load, what I have is I have a, I have a setup views here. Uh, in the setup views, I use the wonderful RX data sources uh, library, and then it will help you actually, you know." Just, just help you abstract away all the, all the data source delegate, all that. So, and secondly, this is the most important part, which is like bind view model. So this is where we actually perform the binding. We perform the bindings to the view model because the view model will expose uh, like public subject, like or behavior subject, so that 
uh, it can it can help you uh, it can create hot observable for you so let's see I have uh, this one is not too important so the VM dot username stream let's go here which is this one this one this name thing oh crap so this name is the VM dot username stream so when I change this 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 will actually uh, emits a new item and uh, it's set name name label dot rx dot text same similar similar for this and this and this is where the action happens so insert user button dot rx dot tap so when I tap it I want to create a new like just create a new random user and put it in a database and I want to see that new user reflected immediately on the UI because I don't want to wait so so you see so when whenever I so the entire code for that is just this it's just this there's nothing else there's no there's no communication between any of the views at all you just need to do just just need to bind it bind this here bind some of this here so your view control uh, view controller code is extremely short so uh, it's like you know um, probably how many lines uh, 250 lines and uh, all be so because all the view state or the view logic would go to the view model so, but this is not the this is not the most important part because what the view controller does is just to display the data. But let's say I want I want to edit this. So this one would go to the user text cell. So each each of the cell here would have one view model. So the the main thing that you need to get right about MVVM is that only models can create models and only view models can create view models because this way would it will help you with dependency injection. Let's say you have a singleton that you create in, in UI application delegate, and then you create the master view model, which is like your app navigation controller, uh, and then it will keep passing along the, that singleton instance. So you so in so in the sense that you will not have ever have to use singletons like in, in the main app again. So in the user text cell, what I have here, so this is the request framework in action. Um, okay, the text input, I mean, just to make matters short, uh, the text input stream is something that it will receive the input. So the text input stream, I think if you put a lot here, okay, let me, uh, let's give me a minute to build it. Okay. See, do you see this? So this one is simply a simply a behavior, uh, behavior subject that can that can accept strings so map non nil empty is just a custom method so in in order to to uh, to take away the the, uh, the optional sign so with latest from the db user stream and i want i want everyone to focus especially <coughs> on on this db user stream because this is what this is what is beautiful about this framework so uh, in terms of the okay so after that i do i do i update the value so update user property uh, this is a method from the model and then I, f I filter it to see whether whether it's the same value or not and after that okay let's go this one update triggered use update user on text triggered this thing until un until changed uh, in order in order to filter out like duplicate values and then so this is the main thing so update perform will be update triggered flat map latest to update user in DB uh, and then I also use Redux here to, to post an error to display it globally. So, I mean, this is just MVVM, it's, it's nothing special. But what, what, is, what is most important is this method. So, DB user stream, DB user stream, okay, where the hell is it? Okay. So the provider track object measure, uh, manager dot DB user stream. And what is this DB user stream is? Here, this is a track object manager, and this is the approach that we use in the Glycolit app. So let's say we have a central user stream, which is simply just a behavior subject, uh, and wrap in a try user. And then when we set up, we initialize the user stream, right? So the DB request manager, this is the request framework. Stream DB events for user.self, uh, perform on user interactive 
dispatch uh, QoS and uh, transform the request to, to use uh, descending sort for updated app. Flat map into uh, just load the section, get the object. So if, if, it's, if the object is not available, throw an error or this and that. So, so after that, we bind to the DB user. And as you can see, if I put a log next here, uh, I think log next prefix. I think it will be easier to see. Uh -huh. Crap. Okay. So uh, I mean, I have a custom string convertible, so that you, it just prints out the ID, right? So every time you update the user object, it will appear here. So so with the new properties. So so this is this is how this is how we do uh, reactive functional programming because all these views only listens to one stream, which is the DB user stream. So every time the user object changes its property, it's, it's uh, then it's reflected everywhere else. So it doesn't matter it doesn't matter where you go, um, how how many views, how many layers of views you have, you only have one stream, and that is all, and that is like oh the only DB user stream, and you don't have to do anything else. You don't have to, uh, you don't have to worry about view will appear, view will disappear. I mean that is like so 2015 I guess, um, and then another thing about that is that if you see if you see this one. This is the this is the example of the railway architecture. So upset in memory is a is a is a function from the request framework, and then I will map because because here I'm I'm using a try a try is a monad that helps you uh, that wraps the error for you because um if if you if you have used a uh, functional language like Haskell, then they will have like maybe they will have either, but try is more of the Scala concept. So with this we can be absolutely certain that our Rx Swift streams will never throw errors because uh, I think the biggest catch of a uh, of, uh, Rx Swift architecture is that you know sometimes when, when a stream throws an error and it will just die because uh, on error is a terminal event. So with this, uh, with this try, all events are successes. It's just whether it's a try success or try failure. Uh, come on. Okay, try success or try failure. So, and lastly, so let's say um, this library will also help you do optimistic locking because uh, we, we have tried to solve a lot of concurrency issues with immutable data. So, you know, with immutable data, you never have to worry about concurrency, but there's always the risk of like the, the core data database having too many writes. So coming to it, so sometimes you would have like the wrong, the wrong uh, version and then uh, the user object or what, uh, whatever object you want to update will become outdated. So this library will help you do optimistic locking in a sense that, let's say, uh, I think I mentioned before that the HMCD object master type is the minimum that you have to implement. So if you want more functionality, uh, you would have to implement HMCD versionable master type and then uh, let me comment out some of these. And these methods will help you uh, get the correct version in a sense. So uh, the versioning in this case I use is, a, is an updated app. So every time I update the user object in a database, I would create an, I would have a new updated app date. So that, you know, so, so when you use an old object to update the database, it will throw an error. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to artificially create a race condition. So in this case, as you can see here, uh, I have the update user and DB method, and then I put an observable timer. So let's say I put five seconds. Five seconds, uh, I think that'll be enough again. Five, five seconds, five seconds, yeah. And then something very interesting is going to happen. So let's say um, when I do this, Firstly, it will wait five seconds before it update the database, right? But because we use with latest form, if we immediately after we update this, we update this, and then the this one will take an old object because uh, it hasn't had time to update the user object in the in the database yet, and now we have intentionally created a uh, a race condition because this one will have to wait like five seconds. 
Yeah, I mean, usually it's very fast, but it's just that it's, it's for the sake of, you know, uh, because we programmer always try to be perfect. So let's say uh, I update this, and then I update this. Okay, just wait five seconds. Okay, then the, the library will help you help you detect whether there was a version conflict and will just uh, it will help it will throw this error. So the existing version, which is like the old version, uh, is you know at this time I think it's like I think around that. But the the conflict version, the version that you use to update the database with, is is the older one. So that, and then you have uh, not just throw error, you have a lot more strategies. To to perform optimi uh, optimistic locking in a sense. Okay, so this is the singleton type, and then uh, let's say I want to version conflict strategy. So override. So it doesn't matter whether there's a version conflict mod. Just override. Don't care. Take take preferable to like let's say you want to take the the latest version or the older version or to to merge so if you want to merge then you have to provide a merging strategy so i think um one problem we face with glycolib is that you know uh in the old app before i refactored there was a lot of concurrent modification to the user object and sometimes the user object will have like the the photos array there's a string you know it's not updated correctly and then uh when you post it to the server it actually so the user selects a photo, but because you know you 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 don't use you don't use like the the correct strategy to update the to update the server, then actually when you update the user object that is updated in the server doesn't have any photo at all. So sometimes the user would complain that wait why well, I I set a photo the last time why is it not appearing this and that. So uh, with with this strategy, let's say we don't care which version is the correct one. We just le uh, let's say a merge strategy is like. Always take the one with the non-nil photo, something like that. Yeah. So, um, so I mean, but I'm just gonna stick with error because that is the simplest case. I mean, you can totally, you can totally just uh, ignore it. And another thing that that the request framework will help you do is that it has middleware, and this is a big, very big feature. I mean, I think if if you have developed for backend on Node.js before. Uh, and you use express.js right you and you will you'll be aware of like middlewares because middlewares will intercept all requests and then uh, it will help you like transform the request into something that you like so in this case i have the request middleware here and uh, i want to let's say i want to add the number of retries so every time it fails it retries three times so uh, this is this is the clone builder in action the clone builder in action uh, with retries this and then if you want to you want to add the version control strategy you can also do that or you want to to add logging so you add logging of the request is also supported so you see uh something like performing upset description upset user in memory is this uh, the the effect of this middleware and uh okay so it it may not be like immediately apparent in terms of the benefit, but uh, uh, let's say in a in a very in a very typical app, we would have to have the uh, authentication token posted to the server, and then we have hundreds hundreds of requests. So you have like update user, update timeline, update weight, update foot, and then if you use the classical way, you will have to repeat the code to copy the to copy the headers like a hundred times. So, but with middlewares, we just add it once here, just add it once, and then it the the headers will al be automatically applied. So I think this is a very bad example. I don't know whether I should. S oh shit! I think I think you guys should delete that. Delete that part. Yeah. But it's fine. It's fine. So. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm just gonna copy this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is the last one. So let's say um, the network request header. So this is the middleware, right? So uh, because because we have a lot of uh, requirements in terms of localization, in terms of um, authentication token, you know, the device ID, all that. So what we do is we get authentication token params, 
and then we just use uh, we just use a lot of Rx methods to transform this, and then we add this middleware to the middleware manager. So on every network request, this this header will be automatically applied to a request object, and then it's it gets posted to the server. So this this is useful b because like all your requests are very bare minimum. So you only need to specify like the endpoint. Uh, you only need to specify endpoint operation like get, post, all that. But all the base URL, all the headers, and everything will be taken care of for you uh, with the middlewares. So uh, I guess uh, that's it. This is this is a huge, huge effort. We spend so much time on this. And uh, if you want to know more about reactive functional programming, you can also look at the the reactive Redux implementation we have on our GitHub page. Uh, whole mask. Ah, oh. fuck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so sorry. Yeah. So you you can also look at uh, our uh, Redux implementation. So. As, as uh, I think if you if if you recall correctly, just now I di I display an error due to the version conflict on the screen. So everything everything uh, with that error there there is a global stream just for errors, so that you know you just post you post an action to the to the global Redux state, and then it just you know it just get displayed by by a centralized view controller. So I guess I think if if nothing sticks, maybe just one thing to take away is that. Uh, in a reactive functional, I think reactive functional programming is the future, and uh, it will help us build scalable apps. Uh, it's better to get started now because you know it's better late than never. And I mean, if you have any question, I I kind of forgot to put my contact details here, so just gonna do that. Uh, I don't I don't use Facebook, so um, I'm mostly active on on Telegram. You can reach me at Thai Farm, or you can add my number. <laughs> yeah. Oh shit. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, yeah. I, I'm always, always be av av available to answer your question or visit my GitHub page, Pokemon uh, 92 GitHub. Yeah, this one. I have a lot of like open source libraries for JavaScript, TypeScript, uh, Java, Swift, you know, all that. And uh, this is a uh, a project that is very close to my heart because, you know, um. I since since I don't have a programming background, I I don't I, I wasn't I wasn't uh, bound by like OOP shackles, so I wasn't bound by convention. So Rx Swift was one of the no Rx was one of the newer technologies that I picked up like very early in my career. So that's why uh, I I can vouch that it's very it's very good. Um, if maybe it's it's just it's not the shiny cool thing that you you hear all the startups talking about anymore because they are actually people implementing it day to day which is what we do we rewrite the app like completely 100% just reuse the views and everything is mvvm and rx swift and it the result has been very promising so far uh, like close to a month of testing no crash because because i think because the reason why there's no crash because there's just no way for you to crash because there's no shared state when you when when you don't have shared state, you don't have cross view communications. Then how how do you crash? I mean, unless you intentionally put a fatal error, uh, which I mean most of us don't do in production, but sometimes we do in in debug. So, I guess um, yeah, that's it. If you have question, feel free to ask me. I'll be I'll be hanging around eating some pizzas if there's left. Uh, very exciting topic. So the app was, was has been around for like two years. So it was written in Swift. Yeah, it wasn't. It was written in Swift. So I think the the old app was written with like normal core data. So you would have that like context dot fetch, and sometimes you don't perform it on the correct thread, so it blocks the main thread, and when you scroll, very laggy, all that. Um, and then uh, thread thread management in in core data is a big topic. So yeah. Yeah, I w I wouldn't even say corruption. So let's say you you create a disposable context, right? And then somehow you don't keep a strong reference to it. 
and then all the objects in those in, in that context will be nullified. So all the properties build. So some, when you access those properties, then your app just crash because uh, you know you cannot access a false unwrap. You know this and that. And oh, and and then uh, one one more thing, I would advise everyone to just ditch false unwrap. Always use optional. Uh, you know, just our principle. And then uh, so after I joined, I was I spent two months at the QA uh, QA engineer. Um, I was writing like UI tests for, for Android and iOS. So I, I noticed that UI test is just not effective because if you don't have a very well unit tested code base, it doesn't matter how many QA person you hire. The app will just crash after maybe like you use it for a thousand times and then it's just crash randomly. The logs and crash, uh, crash analytics not even that clear. Then there's no way. Then so all those bugs get downgraded because no one can solve. Because no one knows where the source of the bug is. Sorry. But if you use RX Swift, the source of the bug is very clear because you only have one one stream. I mean, not RX Swift. This library, yeah. RX Swift. Uh, the I think the beauty of it, it supports a diff very a lot of different ty styles of programming. So this is the one that I've taken to to follow and. And uh, another thing, you can do this whatever whatever framework platform you do uh, you you are going to uh, develop on. I I've used this on on front end apps and Android apps, and uh, so so this is more of a general software engineering uh, you know sort of stack and framework. The core data implementation is just accidental because you know just uh, at that moment I needed that so. Anyone? 